All right, so a bit of a quick disclaimer. Majority of the stuff here will be really about, about our API journey over the last two or three years. And we are only on the very first steps of our microservices journey. Uh, maybe a couple of months in, so if you have any questions about that, like, I'm happy to answer them. But most of the stuff here that was presented by API days is about how we do our APIs and how that enabled us uh, to get one step closer to the perfect microservices architecture that exists. Um, all right. Um, so I'll quickly introduce myself. Uh, my, name is, my name is Piotr Rohala, and I'm a software and solutions engineer. If you're wondering where the accent is from, I'm originally from Warsaw, Poland. Uh, after leaving my beautiful homeland, I found myself in London, UK, where I worked on the world's largest JavaScript in-text contextual platform. Uh, and I know it's a bit of a mouthful, but you probably know it as <laughs> um, I apologize for that. Uh, after leaving UK, I moved to Australia. Uh, I joined Sportsbet. I'm a solutions engineer, and I'm a part of the solutions architecture and engineering team. I'm a self-proclaimed API evangelist, and even more self-proclaimed CNO, a chief knowledge officer. <laughs> um, so that's about me. Uh, next slide is probably a bit irrelevant in a fully Australian audience, I presume. Uh, but a few quick words about Sportsnet if you haven't heard of us before. Uh, so Sportsnet is Australia's largest online bookie uh, with over $1.9 billion of revenue. Uh, we have just under half a million of active customers. Uh, I apologize to the uh, TV. Uh, <laughs> unlike our less cool competitors, we are 100% digital, meaning we have no retail and we operate from internet only. Um, so that makes technology a major pillar, a major thing for, for the company. Um, we are famous for taking a piss at pretty much everyone, including ourselves. Um, <laughs> a few of our interesting uh, activities. And yes, this is, com this is a company logo on a pair of bulks on one like a big sheet somewhere. Um, to continue. To give you a good what overview. Was this exactly? That's this stuff. It's not my desktop. No. Uh, but I thought that to give you a good overview of API development at Sportsnet, I'll start with a bit of background. <laughs> um, so just very quickly, when I started working at Sportsnet three years ago, I was part of a tablet web development team. And we were responsible for building a mobile version of our website work on tablet devices. It was a single page, backbone JS powered, and that was before even React or Angular came along. Uh, single page JavaScript application. We worked alongside our colleagues from mobile web, native iPhone, and native iPad teams. Our yet another side of the team was providing APIs to use by, by all, the, all the four clients. Um, all clients were developing in parallel, again, again it's constantly changing and evolving Yes, so you, you can guess how fun is that at the time. Um, so if there's one learning to take away so far, is that if your development teams are siloed, you're going to have bad time. Uh, we'll talk about it a bit more. Uh, in 2013, we failed to launch all of our mobile <laughs> platforms. <laughs> all teams, despite of putting crazy effort, working crazy overtime, didn't have stable and performant APIs to go live against. As a result, we missed all of our deadlines. <laughs> and the culture of blame, the us versus them, Richard speaking, our initial API undertaking at Sportsnet had disastrous effect for our morale and culture. So you must start wondering what actually went wrong. Um, so here's what our main mobile stack looks like in a little bit more, little bit more detail. Four customer-facing applications. Since then, we actually deprecated the tablet platform, so it's just mobiles. And one middleware layer. And the middleware layer was responsible for providing a RESTful-ish interface to our vendor-developed legacy XML RPC platform. So the only way to interact with that XML RPC platform was via an HTTP post of an XML payload get another XML panel back. Not my idea of fun. Uh, 
<laughs> um, the middleware team was responsible for building two sets of APIs. So the first API was what we call user API, which was a layer over a transactional XML RPC that dealt with anything customer related. So stuff like retrieve account balance, deposit money, add a payment method, or finally place a bet. The second set of APIs, Pub API, was anything related to, as the name suggests, publicly available data, such as um, competitions, events, markets, all the stuff that Pandas can actually place a bet on. Um, so again, what went wrong? Like this doesn't look that complicated. Um, even before my time at Sportsnet, the middleware started as a .NET application. Now, deemed not performant enough, <laughs> um, our architect at the time decided to bring in an IBM data power <laughs> to solve the problem for us. Um, for those of you who don't know, IBM data power is a physical gateway appliance uh, that costs a lot of money and it is really good at transforming XML. Uh, and it's really good at transforming XML into JSON and that was really our primary use of it. But it's also a wolf on steroids with throughput protection and a bunch of other amazing features. Um, it works best in a bank-like environment where you can stick it somewhere in your legacy backend, configure it, and forget about it. Now, for organization, as dynamic as Sportsman, constantly stretched uh, in terms of the throughput in our house biggest days and constantly kept on our toes by our competitors. Uh, the use of a vendor locked in appliance was simply not compatible how we want to operate, uh, especially for development of our user facing APIs. Uh, data power shut the door for API development for everyone outside of the core middle of our team. With various vendors brought in to help us building it, once they left, we ended up with the appliance at the heart of our business and a vacuum of knowledge around it. But data power was hard to work with first place. Um, <laughs> yeah, so data power. Uh, data power was hard to work with in the first place. Um, with no access to extensive virtual edition, all devs had to share a single physical environment. Uh, <laughs> local, fast local development was impossible. Even the coding itself was a nightmare, as the only language of choice was XSLT. Uh, we had horrendous, <laughs> no easily maintainable code, non-existent unit tests, and unit tests, and laughable integration tests. Our complex business logic lived in XSLT code, and problems that could have been easily solved with a single line of link, lambda, or underscore, exploded into hundreds of lines of XSLT code. We ran into multiple performance issues with our data power platform. Throughput promised by IBM held up for small and simple payloads, but our use case, especially around retrieving hundreds of transaction items or performing multiple asynchronous calls uh, and then stitching them together using complex XSLT logic, was one tiny issue that our ex architects overlooked. Um, we spent all of 2014 leading up to the spring carnival in November, remediating performance problems of our data power platform. All of the mentioned public APIs, often back and forth, all of, the, all of the mentioned public APIs were moved away and developed from scratch by our vendor, circumventing the legacy, the legacy XML RPC platform, really the way it should have been engineered and architected from the, from the start. The user data still stayed on data power, we invested countless man hours, constantly tweaking XSLT and running countless performance tests, and even went to such extreme as disabling logging on the appliances, <laughs> just to make sure that the data powers won't crash during our highest throughput. We developed several contingency methods where we wanted to start switching users to use mocks to avoid the appliances from crashing again during the highest throughput. Uh, the magic number after which our data power stack would crash for that year was 800, 800 transactions per second for the entire cluster. We reached 780 <laughs> that year and somehow we stayed up. So, a 
and this is a bit of a controversial slide for some reason. Um, if I was to reflect on everything I said so far and what I took from that experience personally, I could probably summarize as follows. One, if your architects can't code, get rid of them. Two, <laughs> if you're exploring new technology, build a POC around your hardest use case. And three, build your platform around inclusivity and openness. The risk will always pay off. So, moving on to the good stuff, like, that's why we're here. Um, during the performance remediation of 2014, we all knew there must be a better way of doing things. So, me not taking lightly my role of a chief technology as officer, I knew the answer is no. Um, I kicked off a proof of concept to build a new API platform that would do exactly the same thing as that power, but this time using the power of open source. Uh, the only problem was that the new API had to be bit by bit compatible, it had to be lift and shift, and it had to have no impact to the existing clients to be easily adopted. And this is how, how our API for core services, ACS for short, was born. Uh, ACS does exactly the same thing, and it sits in exactly the same place as data power. Uh, but its open nature and scalability, extensibility, uh, and ease of testing and development is what really sold it to my colleagues in technology and in the business. We adopted Swagger as our official brand new API specification and used Node.js to generate the spec out of the API routes defined within the application. Uh, awesome tools like Swagger UI allow our BAs, QAs, anyone in the business really to explore, browse, and play with the data returned by our APIs. We literally bound any form of quickly going out of date document-based documentation. And 100% of our customer-facing APIs at Sportsbet now have code-generated Swagger docs. And that includes our Java services as well. It wasn't easy though. Um, one of the very first issues we ran into was the XML to JSON transformation. Uh, that ironically, data power is so good at. Uh, we've explored several, several node XML to JSON modules, uh, but not even the native C modules were fast enough to compare with the speed of data power. Uh, not even a single call, not even under load, was one and a half times slower than one going through the data power platform. Question? Just a quick question, data power, was that the device and .NET, or is that just the device? It started with .NET, right. that was completely scratched, got it, done, and everything was developed from scratch once again on IBM data power. Cool. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, the, the code that we ran from, from LJS was so much slower because of the required XML transformation. Uh, some of you probably seen this diagram before, uh, and I don't know how much you guys know about Node.js and its internals, and I'm not going to go into much detail, but if there is one thing that Node.js is really, really good at, it's handling thousands of concurrent requests request per second due to its asynchronous I.O. The one thing that is really bad at is anything CPU computational heavy, anything such as XML to JSON transformation. Uh, and the load tests we ran were spiking the CPU uh, and slowing down responses because of this inherent behavior of no. Luckily, we came up with a brilliant idea to offload this piece of logic to software we all know and love, Nginx. Uh, we wrote a custom Nginx RPM enhanced by a set of Lua extension, extensions that allowed us to convert XML into its one-to-one -one JSON representation finally end up with a JSON structure we were happy with. Uh, Nginx Lua sits between the backend and the Node.js instance on the same machine and handles XML transformation only. The orchestration and all the business logic is still handled from within the Node.js instance. The Node.js application server is easily horizontally scalable simply by adding another VM. Um, this interesting Nginx on a backside setup allowed us to match data power in 
terms of processing speed for all of our XML payloads. We achieved this on a 6 vCPU virtual machine compared with a physical IBM appliance. Even the cost saving was insane, as we managed to replace hundreds of thousands of work of IBM kit with a commodity hardware and open source software. That's how we thought. <laughs> <laughs> Are you just the Nginx, so we just try to throw other options? Yes, we, uh, so because we because all of our stack runs on CentOS, .NET wasn't an option, uh, but we looked at Java and coupling our Node.js services with something as heavy as JVM, running on which box, just wasn't, wasn't, wasn't the solution we were after. So Nginx was lightweight enough, uh, and we use it in other places, so just having a different RPM, all the Lua stuff to do external processing it was just perfect. It was a perfect solution. It's a forked version of the official Nginx? No? It's an official Nginx with band, there, and there is uh, Lua extensions that you can <coughs> compile it in. I think in the latest Nginx they actually allow you to include that without recompilation. But, uh, but the way how we did it was with we compiled the problem to Africa. Um, yeah, so that's, that's how we did it. And then a bunch of Lua code, and it's actually quite small uh, yeah, to, to, to do that transformation. Can you go to the slide guide on the architecture diagram, please? Yeah. Okay, so Nginx sort of transformed the XML to. That's right. That's all it did. So, as, as you can see, actually, on the way there, there is no XML transformation. So, we did it for, for we actually did it for two reasons one, performance, and two, our legacy RPC backend is extremely, I don't want to use the word anymore, but extremely. <laughs> Uh, fussy, that's a good word, <laughs> about the XML structure that we're actually sending in. So if you end up with something like JSON that by default doesn't guarantee the order of your attributes, and then you need to have an XML that has very, very set order of attributes. So if you put XML in your customer ID first and then mobile number second, if you flip them around, the bucket will just freak out. So on the way there, we basically used a bunch of templates. So so we use like a low dash template that we but it, basically treat on the way there we treat XML as if it was a string. Yep. Hmm. Was there a reason you didn't put Nginx in front of the XML RPC at the service level instead of at the node level? Like if you look at your scaling, you've got a Node.js instance for every Nginx instance. Yep. If you look at putting an Nginx instance in front of XML RPC, so it has different scaling attributes than so that stuff is used by some legacy apps as well. Yeah, all right. So it made sense for us, for the customer-facing APIs, to have that, that service self-contained, so we manage everything within that single user. Because I'm assuming you can probably service a lot more requests with minimal instances of Nginx than your node. Like we, we could have gone with like an Nginx farm, right? Yes, like, a, yeah. like an Nginx gateway, yeah. really. To go through that. To do that, all of that. Did you go through that decision making to find out which way was better? Uh, we didn't. Yeah. Uh, just because we wanted to keep that deployment yeah. uh, sort of self contained. Mm -hmm. Rather than maintain yet another gateway, we had really bad experiences with those yeah. uh, in our stack. Yeah. Fair enough. Cool. All right, let's continue. Um, so, so, all that aside, we had problems of completely different nature. Um, and I would not lie, every time I heard the phrase, it's not even 1.0, if I got a dollar for every, every time I heard this phrase, I will probably buy myself a data power. <laughs> um, throughout the development, the maturity of Node was constantly challenged by a small set of, in of individuals. And for us, knowing the challenges of introducing completely new tech to a company, we had to find a way to always stay one step ahead naysayers. Uh, so we built a bespoke CI CD pipelines for our Node.js services and we incorporated static code analysis tools such as Sonatype Sonar to showcase and highlight high code quality and unit coverage. We've implemented Checkmarks, security static code analysis tool to prove that our code is as secure. Even before going to production in May 2015, we ran a successful penetration test with a pen tester having full access to our code base. We work with our DevOps team to add a bunch of sensor checks to ensure that our applications can be easily monitored. 
Uh, we define new ways of gathering logs and metrics and pump, pump, pump them into Graphite and Grafana. We use a variety of tools to simplify development and testing. Oh, two questions. Which version of Node 0.0 we're we using back then? Back then, 12.7. Okay. And how big was the team that you could doing all this kind of like, you know, code checking and kind of verification to the outside world? Like, did you have a, lot, a strong core team that was there for a while? Or? Mm, it was probably between five to six people. Yeah, the team was quite small. Was it devs purely or dev tests? What, what was that? Like? So, engineers. We don't test. No, 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 no. So, test, test aside, but the reason I say engineers is because we put actually very high focus on engineers who are DevOps people as yeah. well. Uh, because you can't just write a code and hand it over. So, we we're not there yet. Uh, I'm not going to pretend that you know, it's, it's a perfect place, but we're really trying hard to get that DevOps culture growing and running. So, so we had, like, I was actually quite lucky that I worked with people that were uh, gifted in all, in all these areas. Um, so yeah, that's why it went actually quite well. Uh, moving on. Luckily, we don't have to defend Node.js anymore. Um, when Node.js Foundation was announced, companies such as Join, Microsoft, Intel, PayPal jumped in uh, and decided to support the project. Even IBM came in to join the party with their acquisition, with the recent acquisition of Strongly and overall great support for Node.js on the Bluemix platform. IBM treats Node.js more than anyone like a first-class citizen. Uh, the fear of lack of enterprise support for Node is no more. But why did we choose no? So apart from everything covered so far, Node.js was a perfect fit for our organization at the time, with the majority of developers being experienced JavaScript developers, an API platform they can dive into with minimal learning curve, transform the way how we look at our backends. Uh, that complemented the massive cultural and organizational shift we went through uh, at the end of 2014 and throughout 2015. Uh, we set up an Agile Academy, a trial Agile team that comprised of a cross-skill cross set of people that previously were part of the silo development teams. So with an iOS developer, mobile web developer, QA, a business analyst, and someone from completely new, rebranded services team, the Academy proved that removing the silos and giving people Easy to, e easy to use tools and technology easy to, easy to use and set up, that proved that it is a key to success for Sportsbet as an Azure organization. Now we've got more than five, I think actually eight feature teams, uh, each of them named after the city, my own, uh, and we have no, no more silos. The new API platform allowed the teams uh, to rapidly implement the APIs that interact with our legacy pl platform and ship the features in record time. Um, and the, new, the openness of the new platform even allowed our iOS developers to write their own API endpoints, uh, which was something I've think of before. Uh, feature after feature, some of which you have probably seen in our always on TV ads, were developed on our Node.js API platform. Today, we have a healthy mix of Java-based microservices and Node.js-based microservices and we evaluate each technology and use it when it's fit for purpose. Let's talk about numbers. Um, last year, uh, during the Melbourne Cup, uh, which is our biggest day of the year, uh, our Node.js stack uh, handled 45% of Sportsbet total user-related transaction volume. Uh, if you look at the absolute maximum for Node.js for that day, we reached a staggering peak of over 12,000 requests per second in a given second, uh, and all while maintaining CPU utilization below 20%. Uh, we had almost quarter of a million active connections to our Node.js cluster as well. And even if you look at our Akamai data, uh, the numbers are st staggering as well. We had over 12 million requests processed and over 33 gigabytes of JSON transferred and all in a single day for our Node.js stack. 
So our no, so our Node.js stack on that day ran on eight VMs with six vCPUs and four gig of RAM. Nothing crazy. Yeah. So it's actually quite amazing that Node allows you to allows you to do that. Yeah. Do you have your data center where you're hosting it in the cloud provider? So uh, because I'm not sure on exactly the details there, but because TabCorp has Australia-wide monopoly on running betting operations, all uh, all bookies must operate from the only territory that allows them to, yeah. which is Northern Territory. Mm -hmm. As a result, everyone has their data data centers in Darwin. So because the law because the law basically says that the bet has to be struck in Darwin. So our main database and our main stack has to live in the data center in Darwin. It wouldn't be legal for us. Put it on the cloud or put it in the cloud. Cool. So, this is the, the limitation, the legislation limitation we have to deal with uh, yeah, every day. So, if someone um, digs through the Darwin link, all Why did you say that? Not <laughs> <laughs> uh, last, last year, the year before, someone actually cut both, uh, both wires oh, running, running from, from Melbourne to Darwin. So, they, they cut a, the, the first one. The, yeah, the, the primary and the secondary, yeah. and that was the day before the cut. But luckily, <laughs> my <laughs> um, so on, on that note, like you, you had your teams put out there. Yeah. Now DevOps has got that level of where does infrastructure stop and DevOps start type scenario. Yeah. You don't have any. Is that the services engineer in here, or is that another team? So, so this is uh, what we call product solutions. So th these are the teams that are actually building. The Products mm -hmm. that then end up on our mobile apps, uh, and you're right. There is no DevOps here. Um, so it's it's basically because uh, DevOps run under different uh, sort of section of technology. So our product solutions is customer focused, and technology operations is anything from uh, enterprise help desk to platform networking infrastructure. So they are they're on the side supporting the teams, Got it. but we. The, the ideal situation would be if I had another smiley guy there with a description DevOps. So this is where we're trying to get. Yeah, so the guys who deployed the actual API on this diagram. Well, they're, they're the ones that are pressing the button to, to get it deployed. So that, that automation piece is there. But uh, we've got an infrastructure team that looks after that deployment process. That's right, the operations, the operations team, yes. Um, having multiple feature teams, how do you make sure they don't the wheels that someone just incremented like a month ago in another feature team. Yeah, so this is where my team, <laughs> Solutions Architecture Eng Engineering, comes in to basically help the guys uh, find out what's there, uh, support them with any development. So we basically span across all the, all the business units, all the technical business units, and basically making sure that yeah, they're not rendering on the wheel. So you need a governance layer, just? Oh, of course, yes, of course. So what, what, what what roles did that, I mean, you just described the roles, but were they signing off specifications or just mentoring and guiding the teams into particular decisions that teams would make? Because I have this problem at work now where everyone wants to sign off by the architect and that sort of stuff. It's like, well, no, so we, we don't. So you don't sign we can off. We can strongly disagree yes. with an approach. Uh -huh. uh, and warn about all the pitfalls. All the pitfalls. Yeah. Uh, and if we see something going that we know will end tragically, we will obviously yeah. escalate and someone will put a plug on it. Yeah. But our role is not to police, right? Our role is to guide and support mm -hmm. the teams. And uh, so a lot of the stuff that I don't have, I don't have in this presentation, but a lot of the stuff that we're doing now is actually, I think I will talk about it very briefly, is we're actually setting up bunch of like a bootstrap services, so mm -hmm. stuff like, well, I need a new microservice to connect to the streaming provider. The guys go into our into our bit bucket, internal bit bucket, and they can run, they can fork like a bootstrap repo, and they're they're already there. So like all the like RPM packaging and and where they put their unit tests, where they put their integration tests. There is a bundle job for them to clone. Like all these what we call Lego blocks. Like that's what we develop. So we console all the teams and, and check what are their needs, and they can contribute to that as well. Uh, but like our job is to is to make that main 
sort of product pipe of the business yeah. to run with the highest throughput possible. Yeah. So in, in, in context to this diagram, how many people are in that team? In your team? In my team, we've got maybe 15 people. 15? Yeah. For supporting this block of people here? Yes. And that's that's, that's been, almost half. That's been a, no, so there's actually more because I sort of simplified half. Oh, cool. <laughs> 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 um, Alright. Yeah. Alright, that's it's back on. Um, so, what's next for Node.js and Sprosbit? Um, so at Sprosbit, we're actively investing in our new Node.js microservices and APIs. We're building our next stage of our CI CD platform that will allow us not only run automated unit tests and integration tests, but also a component performance test. Uh, we're heavily modularizing our Node.js services, so that's something I was just talking about. And we're using our internal Nexus as an internal NPM repository, uh, because we can't put our stuff on the cloud. Uh, we're creating a set of bootstrap services uh, to allow the feature team to spin up new services within a matter of minutes rather than days. As it was before. Uh, I must mention though that we are not all about Node. Um, Node.js is just a part of our vast stack of backend services and APIs. Together with other amazing technology we use for both our backends and clients, it makes Sportsbet technology who we are today. Um, one of the last things I want to say is that Node.js is definitely not a silver bullet decision to start using it has to be very carefully evaluated to see if it fits your, it your business, your industry, and the skill pool you have access to. The one thing for sure is that not the, the one thing for sure is that Node.js is not going anywhere anytime soon. Companies such as Netflix and PayPal are actively migrating <coughs> larger parts of the stack to Node. It allows them to write this code uh, and scale fast. Uh, the event-driven nature of Node is well suited for microservice architecture, um, and it allows it to respond quick to quickly respond to drastically changing market conditions. And sort of this level of software innovation is what we really aspire to at Sportsbit. To wrap all this up, um, from the moment our punters open up our mobile apps to the moment a bet ends up in our database in Dublin. Uh, it is all done through our internal and external APIs. Uh, and the use of Node.js at Sportsbet um, allowed us to play fast to win, rapidly accelerate our API development, and put more exciting products in front of our customers. That's all I have today. Thank you. So, I mean, probably you look at this because you have performance problems going from XML to JSON, but yep. have you guys looked at other, some of it, some of the things that are sort of surfacing now in the communication between the services is libraries like Thrift and Protocol Buffs and, um, it's, but did you guys look at any of those types of things to help with um, no, no, no. like payload sizes and performance down the pipes or anything like that, no? Yeah. Has anyone? <laughs> You, you're using Go as well, Golang? Yes, we use Go for our uh, network infrastructure automation. You, because I know there's a debate of whether or not Golang is better for APIs than Node. So we don't, like our skill pool is probably not big enough to start writing our APIs in Go. Like we really want to make sure that everyone can contribute. But for the infrastructure piece, so we really mainly use it around automating our F5 load balancers, so that you know, whenever we want to create a new pool or take the node out of, out of the load balancer, and so so we have we have a, a set of tools we can go to automate that. So a lot of your hard talk is about capability and evaluating node and culture and setting up teams and yep. work the right way. How about on um, the service infrastructure? I mean, you said you were heading towards that. But do you have anything in place that lets you build these service endpoints behind the, that these mobile apps talk to? And deploy as them and it could get quite well. And so, are, are you talking about the, that? Your infrastructure of services that support the mobile layer. Yeah, so uh, 
we we are only on the start of the uh, infrastructure as a software journey, right? So right. we're not there yet. We have our dedicated networks team, dedicated platforms team. So we are basically a VMware shop. Um, we use Docker only for uh, like non prod environments for stuff like integration testing, component performance testing, starting that now. Uh, but really, everything is just running on a bunch of CentOS VMs. So there are dedicated teams under technology operations uh, units that would support product development with these queries. But we, the, like that full automation of both um, code and infrastructure is where we slowly, slowly, yeah, we going towards that. Do you have a direction where you're going? Is it Docker? Is it like the orchestrations that are coming out, like Kubernetes, Swarm, Mesos? Do you have any vision on what that looks like? So if you ask someone who's not operations, everyone says Docker, right? Yeah, that's the Docker. Yeah. But our operations guys are afraid of it because it's still, in a way, it's still not mature enough. And it also, and I, 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 I wouldn't be able to explain that really well, but it, it has its own challenges, right? It's it, that massive shift from having everything running on your CentOS boxes. And we also have to do a bunch of like vendor developed software. A lot of our core is basically vendor provided solutions. So they would have to dockerize it for us to run it all in the containers. Uh, for the, some of the new microservices, we would love to, we would absolutely love to. Uh, but it's basically between, between us and the operations, our colleagues from operations that we also have to respect and understand their needs and why they don't want to and so on. So it, it won't happen overnight. But Do they have a concern? Like, a, what is it secure? Like, one of the big ones is security. Is that, like, do they sort of like invent what that particular concept, like what that so, concern is? So I think one of the big ones for them is that like we, all of our um, uh, like, like server infrastructure is, uh, it's, all, it's all puppet based. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, that trying changes. to explain to a bunch of old school puppet <laughs> guys, <laughs> that, hey, that's, that's, that's the docker, it's, it's, it's all steps, basically. So that's the one thing I've noticed. The puppet and chef market is starting to dwindle with all of this like swarm, resource, Kubernetes. You don't need to have these orchestration tools anymore because you've got these high level ones. And that's what I'm noticing in the industry as well. It's like the chef and puppet have quieted them down and swarm, resource, and Kubernetes. Yeah, resource. Yeah, we'll yeah. yeah. So, Mark, yeah. Sorry, yeah? No. <laughs> So not that just single thread, I mean, uh, we do not definitely get this. The IO operation, it yep. would be like, it, it won't block, the single thread won't block via call bit. Uh, how did you handle this when, I mean, when, when you call this NGX to get the JSON and it does the conversion? While calling it, I mean, would the thread be blocked or do you manage so that it's, it's not blocked? Yeah, so, so yes, Node.js is single threaded, but in, so if it's I.O. bound instead of thread bound? Yes. And what that means is that if we were to do XML to JSON on the node thread, it would lock the event loop, say, for 50 milliseconds, right? And if you have thousands of concurrent connections locking it for 50 milliseconds, then nothing else can be processed. So event loop is only responsible for <coughs> kicking something off kicking something off, which is a network request to the Nginx saying, hey, I'm interested in this response. Nginx does all that, all that work, and it's really good at it. And then you basically get a callback with a ready, with a ready JSON. So uh, by offloading the heavy CPU operation for us to different piece of technology that is well suited for it, we really use Node the way it should be used. Uh, and yeah, we haven't experienced these problems, these problems but after, after that. So, so, when, when programming. So, so how did you like if you occur to uh, stumble upon some scenario where you can't optionally increase the CPU processing? Like in this case, NGX is there to start you off. Right? Like I mean, if, if we talk about dark, it's, it's multi-threaded. So, is there a CPU intensive task? So, so the, the way how we actually deploy our apps is that we use the clustering available in Node. So we don't we don't just run one Node.js process, right? We run multiple Node.js processes. So when when the application starts, we have a master process that then forks itself to all available CPUs and proxies 
we actually we actually forked twice the number of CPUs because we found that more Node.js processes on that box gave us better performance numbers. So that means that on our 6V CPUs, we actually have 12 node processes that are processing all these requests as they're, as they're coming in. So clustering in node is basically a way to go around that single threading problem. So, so yeah, I mean, in a sense, I mean, it won't be multi-thread, but multi-process. Yeah. That's right. Yes. Multi -process. Yes. Yeah. So, right, right. so the rule of thumb here is this, is it promises or? Yes, promise. If the promise is not going to come back immediately, don't do any node. Is that virtually the rule? Uh, no, because that actually doesn't matter. Because uh, that the other way of maintaining that uh, come back to me eventually, that that thing doesn't yeah. really matter. I tell you, okay, so I'll probably rephrase the question: If the promise is of pulling an external resource and not being executed in the node thread, mm -hmm. then it shouldn't be done in node. It should be done off box or into another process that's not known. If, if that operation is yes, long, exactly. then you would spin up, you could spin up like a worker process. Yes. Like there, are, there are ways around this to, yeah. to do it. In, uh, yeah, and, and multiple process, I mean like, I mean, do you know how, how would you like, I mean, it, it, it might not be exactly what you presented for, but like how would you handle uh, the state locking of states? I mean, it, making it like process safe rather than thread safe? So if data sharing happens like between? Different process, like in case of multi-threaded, we have this thread safe concept, and it's we get it out of the box. Like, uh, but mm, that, that, not sure if I have a good answer. Like, like the like all of these services are stateless, right? So they yeah. the request comes in, and the master process says, okay, which child process should I just give it to? Mm -hmm. So when the child process dies for whatever reason, the master would then just restart it. And then if the master dies, then because unfortunately we use CentOS 6.6, I think we have a bunch of upstart scripts that will keep the, the master process running. Thanks, I get, I get. So the reactive paradigm doesn't inherently have a lot of the multi-threading problems that you have in a thread. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, yes, yeah, yes. Yeah. Do you have a question now? Yeah, of course. Tell us because there's no threads, you just study threading. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you guys, um, so initially you used Node.js to replace some of the existing APIs. So the API, you already know what it looked like and everything. Um, obviously you would add in features and things like that. And you've been dabbling in Swagger. So you guys thought about or attempted doing any design first API development where you start, say, from Swagger and then generate things or use that to build? Yeah. So like, like the way the way how sports really operates in terms of product development is that our product management team will come out with something new and cool and it will be packaged as a, as a project. And then that project will be presented in front of feature teams. And uh, I'm not sure that still happens, but when I was part of teams like a year and a half ago or so, like, we could actually pick which project we want to work on. And the idea of the project is that it has to be small enough that a single feature team can actually develop. And, uh, you take the project on, you uh, you run your sprint zero, which is a bit of like a, a bit of, little bit of cheating in the agile world, but that's where we would do our analysis, most of our analysis, so there's very little code written, and then we come back to the business in a perfect world that we need another four sprints, right? And they would say, we probably have two. So then we would figure out what actually can be delivered, and that feature team implements it across the stack. So we don't really do with our desktop app much anymore because I think 70% of our traffic is now all mobile. Uh, so the team of a mobile web developer, a JavaScript developer, an iOS developer, and some supporting services guys, and VAs and QAs can deliver that self-contained feature and we pretty much ship, ship the production every every two weeks because that's what our screen cadence is. Wait, so you use business stuff from the UI side, not from the services side when you start to design. Yeah. It, it depends. It's like, right? I want it, this it thing really, in UI. It really depends. Build the because, APIs for me. <laughs> because, because if, it depends on the project, right? Because if uh, if the project is something to do with like you know, pricing rules and some crazy stuff mm -hmm. that actually involves, involves a lot of different services, then yeah, the architecture team will kick in and try to put a solution definition in place mm -hmm. consider all the all the scenarios, and then that will be handed over to a team, and you know, they will build. Like one of the 
recent products, which is this uh, bedding over the phone. Like that was developed, it wasn't developed in two weeks, it was developed over several months in, in multiple sprints. But the first thing that the team did was basically full analysis and solution definition. Uh, they put together a solution definition document. So the team itself did all the analysis and came up with an architecture that then got validated and the changes were applied. So it's not like an architect would sit there for six months and then hand it over and they would start implementing it. It's like the team actually has a lot of input into how the things will, will work. And if it's just wrong, like really wrong, then just revisions, multiple revisions, and we get to, to the state that we have to work. But it sounds like a more organic delay. So, so and, and that works for some things, but obviously probably the worst thing is just in time architecture, right? Because you can't like, need to have that big picture. <laughs> You know, you know where you're going. Yeah. So on that note, like, if they got it completely wrong, I don't know how long that team's working on that. It goes back to you guys, gets validated, goes back to the drawing board, starts again. At what, how much patience does the business have with that process? Because that's where I find a lot of struggling. It's not so much the process itself, it's the stakeholders that are pushing down on top of you saying, we've got a deadline, this is it, this is what we need. And I understand the agile, I understand the, um, the organic growth of particular features and how they walk in skeleton, start from one end to the other and coming from the ends. But like, how do you then, I mean I take it your stakeholders are also in this process as well. Then. Yep, and it, it's not like the team goes away for a month and they come up with something and then an architect will look at it and then stand. You know, it's like the, the conversation will happen every day. Right. So it's not by, by reducing that, by, by, you know, it's basically agile slash lean, right? It's like you reduce the feedback, you get people talking. So, uh, it, so eventually, after say a, a month of time assigned to do proper analysis and design, after that time, we actually move with the developer. And at what point do you guys step away and just let the team run with it? Or do you validate from the beginning to the almost shipment time? So, like one one of one of us from the, the solution architecture engineering team probably stick around just like just to be across the, the, the solution, be there for help and support. Uh -huh. But it's really really hands off after, after that initial initial stage. So it's just a caretaker. Yeah. Going through. And and again, it really depends on the project because yeah. sometimes there's something so small that it's yeah, like exactly. yeah, you're adding API endpoint to do something. New. Legacy platform, you see all the patterns are defined. You know, write your, write your tests. We want a new field in this contract. Go for it. It's not. It's not all like amazing and rosy. And it's, yeah, like, we have a lot of, lot of issues, like every company. Uh, but I feel like we've been making really good steps to make it work for us. It's it's very different compared to everyone else, but it has to work for us. So if I could take one of the step around the, the stakeholder, stakeholder management around how to handle the business pressure going on there. At Facebook, we're trying something around uh, the sliders. So part, so we have multiple parts of the product. Some of the products are part of the products are mature enough, and some of the products are not mature enough compared to the competitors. So between our stakeholders and have we have a, we have a fair bit of understanding that the parts of the product that are not mature enough in the market needs short-term investment and short-term delivery, whereas the parts of the product in the market that is mature enough uh, will need a long-term approach so that it can scale you over time. So we kind of set up a slider saying, okay, these are the initiatives, and these initiatives are standing like this, but not part of the sliders. Uh, that would essentially facilitate uh, it's facilitating us to have conversations more effectively rather than just playing the guest game or playing the influencing game within the So where are you, where are you, where are you at? Does the, is there a business analyst in every team? So the way our teams are structured are uh, so there is a product owner in the team yep. and there is a technical team. Right? And then, and then, and then, so we essentially go with pairing approach. So it essentially means that there is two pairs of uh, developers, the so software engineers on the floor, uh -huh. uh, and, a, and, a, and a product owner. Uh, so, so the technical lead itself is a, is a developer. So the product, product owner's role, Scrum Master, all roles, is it they own the actual feature itself and living the feature, or is that coming back from? Business. Well, again, uh, I mean, our uh, uh, individual teams have 
complete autonomy on to how they want to execute the project. Uh -huh. So some of the team follow Scrum, so they will be a Scrum master, some of the team will follow Canva, some follow the agenda, yeah. whatever they want to do. Right? But yeah, with respect to Scrum master, anybody in the team would um, essentially communicate and kind of guide along with the agile processes. Mm -hmm. uh, so there is no established standards. And the support that is it like, I think you have business hours and lots of cyber times? Yes. So, one of the very first, first things you do when you join sports but in product solutions, you, you get sent to a scrum, to a, a scrum course. Um, and so, we follow scrum, scrum principles. Uh, each, there is a floating scrum master that usually covers about maybe three teams. Yeah. Uh, and each feature has a dedicated product owner. Um, and is that product owner in the team? No. So product owner is so product owner is really a project manager that sits with the product management team. They come up with what we should work on next, and they own the project. So they the, they're the like the business sponsor of that project. And when the project kicks off and is given to the feature team, that project manager then is effective product owner, and that's where they join the team and they sit with the team. So they actually sit with Yes. This is the important thing, the yeah. culture. It's like they yeah. sit with the team. They, they have to because like you, you've got so many questions, right? Like you never get like it's not like you can spend six months with a business analyst to spec out two hundred page log, log document to go and implement our responsible gambling uh, yeah. feature, right? Mm -hmm. So this is something that they have high level of idea of how it should be supposed to work. They know that the legacy sort of backend things are there. So it's ready to go, and all the all the dependencies were met, and they would come in, join the team, and uh, like you know, even people like our uh, drugs, DR UX, design research and user experience people. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> just so you don't have anything else. Uh, so our drugs people, they uh, they are also like effectively they're a side of the team. There is a there is a, a UX function in Sportsbet, and they obviously do all of our also designs and whatnot, but when a project kicks off, one of them is assigned to a feature team. So they sort of what we call travel in. So we have a bunch of travelers that will join that team and basically expand its capabilities if they don't have it. So they, do they get shared across teams at that point, or they just dedicate no. to that team it's, for the it's entire not, it's the not of the feature? It's, so, it's if you if you travel in to a feature team for a sprint, uh -huh. that's the only job you do. You have to focus yeah. on that now. You can't, you can't just, because like we also have, like we, we even have like developers and engineers who are what we call travelers. So there'll be a guy who, you know, is, is the only one in the company left with amazing knowledge of data power, right? So every now and then there will, there will still be have, we'll still have some project that has to touch on it because there's some existing APIs not yet migrated, uh, well migrated but not yet used in production that have to be touched or whatever. So he would travel in to the team that meets that sort of skill level. Uh, and stay for the feature. And, oh. and stay for the length of that feature. So yeah. once that, so if the feature lasts for three sprints, he'll stay there for three sprints. And, that, and he's dedicated to that team. The whole, like if there is only three days of work for him in that team, well, he will spend the remaining 20 doing QA work, or whatever other way he can help that feature deliver the commitments of the sprint. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, last question, Nate, is, how long does the feature last for? How many sprints? What's your longest sprint that you've had? So sprint is always two weeks. Yeah, always. Like Sorry, yeah. Yeah, but so it, it it depends, right? It's anything from if it's something small, it could it can actually be done in a single sprint. Yeah, two weeks features out. Uh, like a project that I worked on that I particularly enjoyed was the uh, with the responsible gambling initiative that Sportsman's played big on. Which is really about allowing punters to opt out. Yeah. Like, if you feel like you probably have too much, you can actually go on the app and say, I don't want to bet anymore, ever, or for 20 days, whatever it is. Uh, so, that's a feature that actually works, and I build APIs for that. So, it took us three sprints, so six weeks to get that from the moment we landed with the team to actually get it out of production. It's actually, out of the box. Yes. Uh, and other stuff like, uh, like the, the, the live betting, the fund betting. Yeah. Like that, I think lasted from maybe July up to December. So it was several months because you, know, you had your IVRS provider, you had third parties, you had to deal with a bunch of different uh, 
issues to try to get into. So I want to be in Darwin? <laughs> well, the, the ultimately baddest place in Darwin. Yeah. yeah. Sorry. We're 